Hey, everybody. I'm Lori Hoft, and I'm with Lenny Langley of Sugar and Shit at the Hollywood Fringe Festival at the Hudson Theater. If you want to learn a little bit more about our show, please listen to this interview. My name is Lori Hoft, and I fell in love with theater because I grew up in New York, and I would sneak into the city, and I would go to shows like Cats or Phantom of the Opera, or, and I saw also Lily Tomlin in Search of Signs of Intelligent Life. And that's been my life's journey. I'm still in search of that. <laughs> um, I'm Lenny, and I also grew up being exposed to theater um, also in New York City. Um, I grew up upstate. I went in to see musicals every year on Black Friday, the craziest day in Manhattan on the day after Thanksgiving. And um being part of theater is a way to have a platform and a stage for your voice and to really bring your ideas into the world in a unique experiential way. For me, Lori, I, uh, I began writing uh, when I was a film student uh, as a way to set myself free from kind of the, the bigger mechanisms that would sometimes keep women out of the writing arena. So uh, I've written five screenplays uh, and that started around 1998. Uh, so it, it, it became uh, a, a, an outlet for me that didn't require permission from anyone else. So that's why I like writing uh, theater plays and I also like writing uh, screenplays. For me, Lenny, um, writing has always been a way to harness my imagination as well and to um, put forth a narrative that's under my own control. So I've heard that writing is like experiencing life twice. And so sometimes things happen to you that they're not in your control when they're happening to you, but when you're writing about them, you have the power to shape and curate the narrative in a way that um, might be empowering or might just have your own voice spin on it. Um, and so I've always loved writing for that. And I grew up on the tail end of typewriters. So my first writing experiences in the mid nineties, I was typewriting fantasy stories and romance kind of genre, very Disney for a kid, but um, it's just continued as a, as a daily processing tool for me, to be honest. I actually have a, I have a, a, something I did want to tell you about when I really fell in love with writing, and it is even actually part of the show, Sugar and Shit. Um, my father adopted, I was adopted, and the one bonding experience was my father and I, we went to the library and he would get me 14 to 15 books a, a week and read them to me aloud. And I think that uh, James and the Giant Peach was one of the most imaginative stories I heard. And in the fourth grade, I wrote that into a theater play. So I'd have to say that's really, I, I fell in love with writing at libraries and books kept me company. And my father instilled in me a love of, a love of the literary word. I can say this from my experience last night at the preview, what I find with the theater, the live theater experience is the, 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 the theater is dark, the audience is waiting, they can actually viscerally feel the emotions of the storyteller as opposed to watching Netflix or being cooking a, a pie. So the theater still has a sacred ancient caveman type <laughs> listening to stories on the wall around a campfire. So I feel that's a powerful way to share stories in the theater. And I want theater to survive. I believe, uh, this is Lenny, I, I believe theater is, it's vulnerable in a way that other mediums are. And Lori and I were talking about this in comparison to film. With film, you can make mistakes and then take another, another shot, make another edit, do the video over. But on theater, um, all of you is just on display on the stage, whether things go right or things go wrong, the audience is there on the journey with you. And so the audience gets to go on this little roller coaster ride of experiencing what the actors are experiencing as well and having the power of lights, 
set design, um, music, like all of these elements that bring the story to life in the theater is very unique. We worked together. Uh, we were in a writing group that uh, that was twice a week, and we were in a show together called Mama Drama and Daddy Drama. Uh, that was they were virtual shows. Uh, our first experience together was when we did a grassroots celebration for V Day, which is a celebration of Eve Ens- Ensler's play, The Vagina Monologues. So we did a little just grassroots gathering for that. And then we just kept writing, kept meeting up and writing and reading our writing. Um, so we've been writing um, co- co- like writing together since January. I'll say that what, what I find is great to have a second person um, it just it just gives you uh, it just like opens a window to other things that you may not perceive even about your own work. So it's great to it's great to have another playwright uh, who also is is very serious about the written word. And Lenny is certainly someone who is very serious about <laughs> words. She's a wordsmith. Uh, I'm more of a I'm more of a gut person. Um, but, uh, so I, I really enjoy there being two people to, cause a two person play to me has two, two points of view that can, that can synthesize. And I think that can be more exciting. We've been joking that it might not actually be that I'm filled with sweetness. It might be that I'm actually filled with words. <laughs> um, but I love the curatorial element of collaboration where you have someone else's perception, like Lori said, that gives you immediate feedback into what an audience might feel about your writing. When you read your writing to someone else and you get their impressions, it potentially gives you insight also into your story that you didn't think of or that you might want to expand on as well. So working with Lori has been amazing also with her director training and brain that kind of visualizes where those elements of your story might go and to just create more direction or have more options for the direction that a story might go in because someone else may have a different direction that may be actually really works that you hadn't thought of on your own. And when you write with someone else, you have like this instant kind of, it's not like a security blanket, but you do have an instant like uh, kind of a a support system of, well, have you thought about what that line means? Or are you sure it means that? Or how is, what is it artistically you mean by that word? And that's really good um, just as an artist to immediately address that uh, because I think that helps with the creative process a, a thousandfold. We got this idea. I was in an, a group called the imaginative storm with James Nave and Allegra Houston, and they gave us a writing prompt, which was it start with the word. I remember. And then they said, write for 10 minutes. And I came up with this scene, which was called Sugar and Shit. And so it came directly unexpected on a Saturday morning. And later that day, a prominent uh, theater coach said, you should write that into a play. Her name was Jessica Lynn Johnson. And she was like, you should call the play Sugar and Shit, because it was about a ritual I did in the Berkshires, uh, with a, with an act in an acting and directing workshop with Sandra Seacat. So I get my ideas, they come kind of like through flashes in my mind. I don't ever sit around and wonder what I'm going to write. I have a very easy flow with stream of consciousness. And I have some teachers that really are uh, masterful at bringing that out. I also find that the flow just sort of hits me in those eureka kind of moments where you follow the energy of what you're writing. So there's, I write lots of things, but I don't feel a pull towards all of them. So some of it is about navigating the allowance of giving yourself space to write things that you might not do anything with. So I find, um, a lot of people censor what comes out of themselves in a creative um, brainstorming capacity, but 
a lot of the process that we both share is this way of just letting everything out and then sort of sourcing, okay, which parts of this do I feel energy towards? Which parts of this really do I feel pull towards? Which pieces of this larger content that I created do I really want to craft? And then trusting that and moving forward. A lot of my writing actually, though, is generated from my encounters with really bad people. <laughs> so writing at least gives me a page where I am open to say what I really wanted to say. And I love that written page and that pen for the power it gives me. Definitely we're inspired by our experiences and we're both highly autobiographical, memoir, surrealist, bringing things to life that potentially fictionalize true tales, but really about speaking the truth. And clearly I've had a lot of shitty experiences. <laughs> From 9 to 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning, I think in April, I was in a workshop called The Imaginative Storm with Nave and Allegra Houston. I wrote this scene in a 10 minute write and then from 10 to 11, I went into a workshop with Jessica Lynn Johnson and read it aloud. And she said, you should do that as a play. And that day she made an announcement, the Hollywood Fringe is coming up. And I said, okay, let me take this to the Fringe because I felt people like Fleabag and other female storytellers really were given support by the Fringe community. So I thought, okay, great, no barriers. Fringe, here I come. <laughs> I feel similarly. I've been drawn to the fringe as a place that's a completely uncommercialized, uncensored, nonprofit space for emerging artists to allow themselves to put themselves out there in a raw way before, you know, potential people are telling you you can or can't do this or you can or can't say that or this or that won't sell or, you know, when you make art, there's lots of opinions that people will give you about the art that you're making but fringe is a place where you can really put it out in its um, potentially most bold and unfiltered way depending on where you're going with it after uh, so fringe is an amazing space for for emerging artists and for new voices and to find diverse um, audiences and platforms who accept art of um, taboo of taboo themes and where you might not be able to say things otherwise and something I actually felt the fringe was going to be the opposite of me taking, if I tried to take sugar and shit to Hollywood pitch meetings at well-known studios, immediately they would have a problem with the word S-H-I-T, even though clearly <laughs> it's said in nearly every single film that every Hollywood <laughs> studio is making. So I feel like the fringe has a, a, a much greater um, acceptance of women. And as a woman, that's important to me, that the Hollywood fringe does support women. So that's one of the other reasons that I felt like, you know what, I want to go to the fringe. No, no one can stop us. We can do this. Uh, I went to a networking event, which was put on by the Hollywood Fringe, and I immediately um, felt the passion of Theater Asylum for supporting the Fringe and their longstanding background and commitment to the Fringe. I was impressed with Matthew Quinn and his wife, Bertha. Um, I met them in person and they were so genuine and devoted to the development of artists that I just thought, I, I want these people to be in my life as uh, supporters of the arts and as people who resonate with me. I feel that was so well said. Um, that was pretty much the same as my experience. I think um, this is our first fringe and they were so welcoming and encouraging and excited for us to be part of the fringe community. And so we just um, continued with uh, connecting with them deeper. The story idea came from uh, a performance art ritual I did in the Berkshires in a workshop with Sandra Seacat, in which I was the, an adopted child and I was sitting in front of a barbed wire fence with a bowl of sugar and a plate of human excrement. And the whole ritual, the performance art rituals was for me to break free of the sugar and shit in life. And during my childhood, I grew up 
eating sugar to get through the misery and the abuse. So I would constantly, no one was cooking me dinners. So I would just eat, live on bowls of cereal, mainly frosted flakes. So after I wrote that 10 minute piece, uh, that day, Jessica Lynn Johnson in- encouraged me to do a fringe show. And then it was just like an obsession, like, okay, let's get this done. Then I called Lenny. I had heard that she had written a poem called Dear Sweetness. And I was like, perfect. Lenny and I have overlapping themes. So we got together and we brainstormed. And then we worked for, we worked for months with James Nave as our creative coach. And he's from the artist's way. And between uh, my passion, Lenny's determination, her stories, we were able to form an intersecting narrative. And it was, it was just an obsession. We were like, sugar and shit, it's coming. It's coming out. <laughs> we, we even had a prompt where they had this thing called the shit expulsion headquarters. <laughs> so it was like divine serendipity brought this play to life totally. and our pens and our papers mm-hmm. and James Nave. Yeah. And just to add to that, it was so special when Lori called me and said, hey, the fringe is happening this year. Should we submit something? And it was completely just whimsical. And I thought, okay, I mean, what else are we doing? It's still COVID. Things are locked up, but theaters reopening. This is a perfect time to bring live theater back. Um, And for me, writing the sugar section and um, in the portion that I'm playing in this show, it was a lot of themes that I've been mulling over for about two years now. And um, just the fake sweetness out there, the real sweetness, using sweetness as a survival strategy, using sweetness as a way to deal with your core wounding of your shitty experiences is really what um, the sugar section is about and how people demand sweetness of women, especially no matter what, shit we're going through in our own life people expect us to show up as the sugar and the sweet thing oh, for yeah. them so it was special to really be able to have this platform to refine some things that have been concepts floating around um, from my personal experiences for for my lifetime really but it, it was special to let it out right now And I believe in using shittiness as a coping tool. (laughs) Like if people are just so messed up to you, I think, and I think that, you know, I think that women are really um, kind of uh, demonized if they are not sweet. And that's why I feel that uh, women should be allowed to express a whole spectrum of emotions, just like men do in movies and films and theater. You know, the men are always killing the guy at the end. The women are always like sucking it up. And so I was like, you know what? It, there is sugar and shit for men and women. So let's all let's all hear that reality. Well, the story uh, arc starts with um, sugar uh, in, in a club, getting ready to put on the persona of sugar in order to um, in order to uh, receive or save the men that she comes into contact with. And then the story arc ends with Sugar. Um, one of the one of the men goes wild and is demanding a taste of her sugar, and saying her life doesn't matter. He could break her neck. And then I won't say how the how the end is because I'd like to leave us not have a spoiler <laughs> alert. Is that okay? But it ends with women who are who don't take shit. Let's so it starts with women who are becoming sugary to survive, and it ends with women who are like, I'm not taking SHIT. Period. (laughs) It's this show is Sugar and Shit is performed by Lenny Langley and myself, Lori Hoft. And then we have voice actors, Chris Uffland, Michael Marins, Zeke Retman, uh doing um Presley Cash. And Presley Cash. Oh, um, doing voices off screen. <laughs> uh, and also I did want to say um, we were, we had a, a person who listened to our table read and uh, she wanted to write an original song. So she did write an original song. Her name is Presley Cash wrote an original song for us called a spoonful of sugar makes the shit go down because it's really cool. Like just to hear that our work is inspiring other artists that was like, it, that was just like made my heart smile. 
I want the audience to feel like women should not be silent and they should speak up when they're going through SHIT, that they shouldn't take SHIT <laughs> just because society has uh, a defined role for women as permanent kindergarten teachers. We are much more than kindergarten teachers. And, you know, and also we have the same emotions. Women and men have the same, same types of emotions. So we shouldn't be stifled. We should be supported. That's what I want the audience to take away from it. Here's two bold women's voices and they are, uh, they're uncorked. I would love the audience to feel the sense of shared humanity that we all have. We all have wounds. We all have emptiness inside that we're trying to fill, whether it's with sweetness or whether it's with sugar, or whether it's with shit, with more shit. Um, we all are on this planet trying to survive and trying to make sense of our lives and trying to make sense of what we've experienced. And um that's what we do all share in common, even though it's two individual stories, they're connected through this collective theme of um, survival and moving forward. I would like the audience to take away that no matter who you meet during your day, during your week, you may think that some people have it better or worse than you, but a lot of people have gone through a lot of shit to get where they are. And I would like there to be a, a common ground where people can have a sense of, you know what, everyone's going through stuff. So let me just acknowledge that it may not be spoken, but there were 50,000 steps before I met this person. So I'd like people to be a little more reflective. Uh, people should go to see Sugar and Shit if uh, because the same way they should go see a, like a wild concert, just to have a just to have a wild experience and and to to say like, wow, I was there right at the beginning, and it, it's it's visually uh, it's visually appealing, it's bold, um, and th and they can actually during after our show they even get a chance to write for ten minutes about their own uh, collective experience. They should go see it because it's, it's about uh, ending oppression and uh, trauma and things that, that they probably have went through. So I think that they'll have a heartfelt experience as well as a little bit of a wild ride. I think our show is, it's for the bold hearted. It's for folks who are ready to be exposed in things that aren't often spoken about for people who are ready for a provocative natured experience. Um, even when you get there, we have a performance artist who's transformed our lobby and who's doing art right outside the theater. So we have a whole immersiveness to our show. As soon as they arrive, they're already, um, you know, immersed in the aura of our themes, then they watch our show. And then the second portion of our two hour experience is the writing workshop that Lori just mentioned. So it's a whole arc to it besides just the arc of the actual play itself that we really want people to leave inspired to potentially confront portions of their own reality or their own narrative that they hadn't considered before. And sugar and shit is a total, it's a total art experience. From the moment you step in, there's a, there's a, a, a thing of shit where it says, I'm the shit. And then you can take a picture under it. It's and then there's, else. then there's little pieces of candy all in the lobby. We have a performance artist. Then you go in and then you, then you hear the music and you hear the, the compelling writing I feel is very heartfelt. And then you get to, Go with us. We have people streaming in from Taos, New Mexico, the people where we incubated this story to give our audience uh, an experience of touching their inspiration. So I feel it's they should go because of the art. As a performer, I'm looking forward to the final scene with my uh, with my mother. It just makes me relive something that is makes me feel free. For me, um, I have a lot of movement and dance in my piece and dance has always been my complementary art form to my writing. The dance and writing have been my two 
oldest creative mediums. And so I love that this show merges my storytelling capacities with my movement capacities. And I know that my dance is something that I've had a lot of fans of over my lifetime. And I know that it's always fun to see people react to that part of me as well. So it's great to just have um, the multimodal element of our show um i'm looking forward to seeing lenny prancing around nude on the stage <laughs> in her um in her kinky boots which i have not seen because i'm backstage there are nudity in our um, show <laughs> and then secondly i i, I want to retract my answer i'm actually looking forward to um i'm i'm actually looking forward to people hearing that i have transformed my shit into art and i'm I'm interested in that kind of visceral connection where the audience and I understand I made art out of my shit. People should attend the Hollywood Fringe Festival because it's a it's it's got such a, a diverse voices, new voices, um, things that you're not going the things that you're not going to be seeing on and then that you may one day see on Netflix or Amazon. And also people should come to have the live experience. It's it's a it's about seven to ten venues in a very small uh, walking area. And they're going to get just a great variety of experiences. You can come and see two shows very easily with these Hollywood fringe voices that you're just not going to be expecting. So it's kind of like, it's not like Coachella because that became so commercial, but it's like a uh, fringe of Palooza. <laughs> it's just like a lit. the Hollywood fringe is like a little fringe of Palooza of, you know, artists who are determined uh, to, to get their voices out there. And the audience is really in for a treat. So I think they should venture out uh, to, to come have experiences. I totally agree. That was also completely the same thoughts for me. Um, just the fringe is an experience where people can come support bold artists. I feel anyone doing a show in the fringe is an artist who truly believes in their art, seeing the light of the audience or being out there in the world. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of fringe artists that are similar to us who feel the fringe was a perfect place to truly um, put their work out there despite what anyone else might have to say about it. Things like the Hollywood Fringe are very important because even places like Sundance, once they become popular, they become overrun with celebrity directors, celebrity actors. So there does, Robert Redford's original vision for Sundance was to have a little, a space for original artists who were unrecognized. And that was Redford's original vision with the Sundance, that here we'll, we will create a safe haven for unique new voices. And the Hollywood Fringe is still a safe haven for unique original voices. And the community absolutely, since the community is Hollywood, LA, Pasadena, Orange County, people can drive there to support it. It's, it's a little gem of Diverse, diverse voices and strong voices who are taking a courageous risk. So I think it's very important for the community to keep the Hollywood fringe going and, and to have audiences show up since now everyone's going to restaurants. I don't see any reason people can't go to the fringe. Local theaters are very important because they provide a, a venue for um, shows that will one day end up on Broadway. And also they provide uh, theater training to young artists. They provide a stage and, a, and, a, and a, a membership base of people who will come see people like myself and Lenny. And live theater is not the same as live stream theater, though we've had to adapt to live stream uh, due to the COVID pandemic. Live theater, if there was no live theater and live music, it would be like a very gray world, like a communist Russia at one point in time. So we need to support live theater and the Hollywood fringe and the theater in general so that artists have a place um, and ultimately so that we never become a fascist society that can't hear unique voices. 
The reason I chose the Hollywood Fringe Festival was it's it's got amazing venues, uh, great support, great stages. And for me, uh, it's a way to override the glass ceiling for women. There is no glass ceiling in the Hollywood Fringe. There's actually no ceiling in the Hollywood Fringe. <laughs> you can have, it's just open. And, and that is something that is really impeccable about the Hollywood Fringe Festival. So that is why I'm participating in the Hollywood Fringe. Because in my lifetime, I want to be someone who trailblazed at ending that glass ceiling. And while we were doing this, I went to a, a theater, sh a th I went to a talk with Patty Jenkins and I invited her. She directed Wonder Woman. And I was like, Patty, any, any words for women who are playwrights or, or directors? And she was like, fight on, fight on. And so that's what the fringe is giving me a spirit of like, fight on, fight through any glass ceiling, be, be a Wonder Woman. I'm excited just for folks to leave inspired to make a piece of art in whatever format that might be. That's why it was so cool that the collaboration with Presley Cash, who's a songwriter and a lyricist and a musician came out of this and, you know, she didn't write her own play, but she wrote a song. And so having these other forms of inspiring other artists to create something because they were exposed to our art is so beautiful and I think that's one of the best things about putting your art your art out there so while it's scary and it's edgy to write something especially when it's about your own life and your own story I encourage all other artists to to do so and to bring their art to completion and to a product that's shareable uh, which is the scariest part it's so easy to just write in your journal and do all those things. And that's awesome as well. And that's where these projects begin. But I really hope that folks leave our show excited to potentially make something that they will share with the world one day. We had about uh, 10 or 11 people do a, a write um, in the imaginative storm. And one of the people told me he's planning on doing a show next year at the Hollywood fringe. And I feel like if we as artists contributed to his imaginative storm or to his accessing his creative muse that not only we did our work, but we, uh, we heard his work and we were blown away. If you enjoyed our conversation today, we would love you to come see Sugar and Shit at the Hudson Theaters on Theater Row in Hollywood in Los Angeles on August 29th from 1 to 3 p.m. If you're outside Los Angeles, we welcome you to join our global live stream on YouTube and watch our show streaming online. You can buy tickets on the hollywoodfringe.org slash project slash 7097 or, or on Ticket Taylor, which you can find through our show website at www.tigerlicious.live you should come see sugar and shit why because it's tigerlicious it's tigerlicious and she's sugar and i'm the shit i'm sugar and, and i'm the, the shit. shit i'm sugar and i'm and the, the shit, shit. <laughs> And we hope you enjoy our original theme song, which has been written, co-produced, and performed by musician Presley Cash and, co and produced by Bo Whitfield. It's called A Spoonful of Sugar. Spoonful of sugar makes the shit go down. But tell you who are you when there's no one around. The cheering of the crowd is my favorite sound.
shit go down who are you when there's no one around cheering of the crowd it's my favorite sound who am i when the curtains come down who is your superhero Boom full of sugar makes the shit go down But tell you who are you when there's no one around The cheering of the crowd is my favorite sound But tell me who am I when the curtains come down Begging your daddy for a dollar bill While others took their daughters down snow
there's no one around cheering at the crowd it's my favorite sound who am i when the curtains come down who is your